Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. So today, Monsters, Inc. It's a classic childhood nightmare scenario, isn't it? And what makes it even more terrifying is that there is an uh, intentional effort behind it with a company being called Monsters, Inc. Monsters in the closet who come out to scare you at night because in Monsters, Inc., the closet is a portal to the monster world where the monsters are known as scarers. That's their job title in the business. And they make their way into the children's rooms to collect their screams. However, they have to be careful because they believe that children are toxic, much like my brother does, and that touching them would be fatal. But there's a problem. Children are becoming too hard to now scare. They're desensitized from the monster's tactics, and the monsters are falling behind on their quota, creating an energy crisis in Monstropolis, uh, since the city is powered by children's screams, which they harness into energy. Henry J. Waternoos III, CEO of Monsters, Inc., is determined to find a solution. James P. Sully Sul Sullivan becomes the organization's top scarer but is engaged in a fierce rivalry with the competitive chameleon, Randall Boggs. After a night of scaring, Sully discovers that Randall left a door activated on the scare floor and, and a young girl has entered the factory. After failing to put her back in her place, he takes her and hides her from Randall. His best friend Mike is at a restaurant on a date with his girlfriend Celia when Sully comes over to him to help. But chaos erupts when the girl is discovered in the restaurant. Sully and Mike ex escape the Child Detection Agency, or CDA, who are looking for the child, and they take the girl home, discovering that she is not toxic at all. And Sully grows attached to the girl and names her Boo. I know, right? They smuggle her into the factory and Mike attempts to return her home. Randall discovers that Boo is in the factory after seeing her with Mike in the newspaper and tries to kidnap her, but instead kidnaps Mike. Randall reveals to Mike that he has built a torture machine called the Scream Extractor, designed to extract screams out of a human with a vacuum and make the company's current tactics redundant. Randall straps Mike to the chair. But Sully stops Randall by unplugging the machine and reports Randall to Water News. However, Water News is revealed to be in league with Randall and exiles Mike and Sully to the Himalayas. The two are taken by a Yeti who tells them that they re can return to the factory through a nearby village. Sully heads out, but a frustrated Mike refuses to follow. Randall straps Boo to the Scream Extractor, but Sully saves Boo by ripping the Scream Extractor off his foundation and throwing it at Water Noose, trapping him between the machine and a wall and wrecking the machine in the process. Sully frees Boo, but Water Noose sends Randall after him. Mike returns to apologize, but thinks Sully is going to ignore him because Randall is attacking Sully in anger. Mike throws a snowball at Sully, but hits Randall, allowing Sully to incapacitate Randall and escape with Mike and Boo. Randall pursues Mike and Sully as they race through the factory and ride on the doors heading to the storage, taking into, into a giant vault where millions of doors are stored. Boo's laughter activates the doors and allows the chase to pass in and out of the human world. When Randall attempts to kill Sully, Boo assaults him with a baseball bat, allowing Sully to, and Mike to trap him in the human world using a door to a trailer where the residents beat him with a shovel. They finally reach Boo's door, but Water News sends it back to the scare floor. Mike distracts the CDA while Sully and Boo escape a pursuing Water News. Water News reveals that he is working with Randall to kidnap kids and use the Scream Extractor to keep the company from going out of business and put an end to the energy crisis. But the CDA, recording the confession, arrest him. The CDA's leader is revealed to be the librarian, Roz, who went undercover for two and a half years trying to expose Water News's plot. Sully and Mike say goodbye to Boo and return her home on Roz's orders, and Boo's door is shredded. Sully becomes the head of Monsters, Inc., and comes up with a plan to end the company's energy crisis. Sully's leadership changed the company's 
work, company's workload, and the monsters now enter the children's bedroom to make them laugh, since laughter is now ten times more powerful than screams. Mike takes Sully aside, revealing that he has rebuilt Boo's door and only needs one more piece, which Sully took as a memento. Sully enters and reunites with Boo, and here's where we pick it up. Gee, but I always cry at that part. <laughs> Laughter is ten times stronger than screams. I love that line, because it's true. But screams are easier. At least that's what it looks like, because there are, there are professional scarers in our world. And while it seems like they're making a good living by making us afraid as well, because why else would some politicians, media outlets, and marketing experts want to make us afraid in order to vote for them, consume their content, or buy their products? Fear is a great motivator. It spurs people to action in an effort to end self-protection. Afraid of a new economy, as we look to diversify. Afraid of a change in government threatening the premier's life in a coup d'etat, spelled with a K. Afraid of foreigners who arrive with peculiar customs. Afraid of ISIS, even though they are a world away. Afraid of what people might be thinking of us, even if their thoughts are none of our business. Afraid of missing out on the good life that others seem to be having, even if it's just a Facebook illusion. Afraid of not being safe even while taking needed precautions. I remember how people stopped flying in the weeks after 9-11, fearing to be the victim of another terrorist attack, without looking at the odds of that happening. Because even on that day, how many thousands of planes were in the air in North America, and how many crashed into the World Trade Towers and the Pentagon? Similarly, Greyhound experienced a brief reduction in passengers following Tim McLean's murder aboard a bus a few years ago outside Brandon, as people felt unsafe to ride, despite there being only two violent attacks on Greyhound buses within the, de the decade. Further, we've grown more fearful of crime, even though the crime rate in Canada has been steadily declining since the mid-90s. As overall crime rates have been dropping, media stories have been increasing. Declining crime rates don't make for good stories, nor are they clickbait to amp up page view, views for advertisers. And the church isn't much better. We're better at diagnosing society's problems than we are in delivering hope. We're conversant in important issues such as human trafficking, climate change, poverty in our communities, refugee crises, and waning church vitality, and we forget to point to signs of life. It isn't that we're not supposed to be vigilant about the dangers, toils, and snares that we and our world face, because like in the movie, the monsters are real. And also like the movie, we can respond in a different way a way that's 10 times more powerful than screams. We can respond with hope. We can respond with joy. We can respond by not allowing the monsters to scare us, but in instead laugh at them when they come into our rooms. We can respond by knowing that there is another way to move through a world that can be so scary. Last year, when members of the prayer group with their pastor, Reverend Clementa Pickney of Emmanuel African Episcopal Church or Mother Emmanuel were murdered by Dylan Roof, the congregation and community responded quickly with forgiveness. Many people, including myself, at first said that it was just too soon for that. The wounds were too raw. The grief was too apparent. They needed time to be angry in order to forgive properly. I thought it was a misuse of forgiveness and a misunderstanding of how forgiveness works. It looked to me like they were just putting on a good Christian face at the expense of their pain. But I totally missed the point. I completely misunderstood what was happening and what they were doing. And so did a lot of others. 
listening to a podcast recently with Otis Moss, an African-American preacher, speaking on behalf of the black Christian community. He said that forgiveness wasn't about the shooter. They weren't forgiving the gunman out of some shallow Christian duty. Forgiveness was about them. Forgiveness was an act of defiance against the shooter. Forgiveness was about empowering the grieving. Forgiveness was about not letting the shooter to turn them into who they did not want to be. Forgiveness was about denying the shooter the final victory by allowing them to become embittered and divided. Forgiveness was about not letting that faith community become fearful and angry. Unfortunately, Mother Emmanuel is well practiced in defiant celebration. In the 200 year history, that congregation has been the victim of many domestic terrorist attacks. So they learned the hard way how to respond to hate and violence in their community. And so the funeral of Reverend Pickney and the other victims became a celebration of all that was good in the community. The funeral brought people together, the exact opposite intention of what the shooter wanted when he took his gun into that church. He wanted to ignite a race war. Instead, he strengthened the community. Instead of recoiling with screams, the community responded in a way that is 10 times stronger, with bold laughter, with defiant joy, with audacious celebration. It doesn't mean that the pain isn't still there. It means that life will not be defined by what they fear. It means they will refuse to become what the gunman wanted them to be, angry, afraid, and hateful. We can learn from the witness of our sisters and brothers at Mother Emanuel Church And while we don't face the same challenges they face, we still have our own temptations to fear. Broken relationships, failed dreams. With this economic downturn, many of you are affected directly by losing your jobs or having your jobs put in peril. And the spinoff effects are affecting everyone. And it has the whole city on edge. But this is where faith finds its feet. What does hope look like in this economic environment? What does it mean to laugh today? I think it looks like people coming together and celebrating what is good in the community. I think it looks like some of those who have lost their jobs reevaluating what is important to them and are they making a contribution or are they just making money? I think it's about recognizing the importance of community as once rugged, self-sufficient Albertans draw upon community services. I think it's about the opportunity to reimagine what the economy can look like, an economy that's not so dependent on one sector. I think it's about having faith in defiance of circumstances. Like how Paul admonished the church in Thessalonica, as you heard today, it was a church that had lost its way because it had lost its hope. A people who had forgotten how to laugh because they were terribly divided and they were being persecuted. And they even kicked out the Apostle Paul out of their church, out of their town, which prompted him to write this letter to them that we heard them today. from today. Because in the midst of division and persecution, these were both experiences that Paul knew intimately. In the midst of all that, he says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Those are hard words when you think about it. I'd say that the Apostle Paul was being a little naive when he gave that piece of spiritual advice to the Thessalonian church. But knowing Paul's backstory, he did not have the luxury of naivete. The monsters in his life were real. He was beaten, imprisoned, shunned, 
and discarded by both enemies and friends. The Apostle Paul had a lot to be afraid of. But instead he said, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. He lived like that because he knew his Savior. He lived boldly because he knew that that was the only life that was worth living. He lived in defiance of the powers that tried to destroy him because he knew the power of God's love in Jesus gives him strength to face down any fear or foe so he would walk the earth empowered by something ten times stronger than his fear. Because I often think that fear is giving in to destructive powers. I sometimes think hopelessness is an abdication of responsibility. Because as Christians, we don't have the luxury of allowing fear or hopelessness to drive our lives or our life together. As Christians, we look around with our eyes wide open and we see the dangers that surround us and the evils that threaten us and we say, no, you will not define me. You will not turn me into who I was not made to be. I am a child of God, named and claimed by the one who made heaven and earth, and God decides how this story ends. So I will rejoice always. I will pray without ceasing. I will give thanks for all circumstances. Just like how Sully transformed Monsters, Inc. by realizing that laughter is ten times stronger than fear, we have the opportunity to celebrate the joy that we have together, to laugh together in the midst of the challenges and deploy the energy, that energy, as we move forward in hope. So we will rejoice always. We will pray without ceasing. We will give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us, we will hold fast to that which is good. And may this be so among us. Amen.